trust in you. Lord, I will trust in you, my God. There is a fountain, who is the king? Victorious warrior and lord of everything. My rock, my shelter, my very own. Bless and redeemer. Good morning, Levy family. We are glad that you are with us this morning. I'm not going to steal Cecil's thunder on our first day back in the building for those who have chosen to join us this morning. It's wonderful to see most of your faces this morning, uh, and so we're, we're glad to, to be together. Let's, uh, let's praise God together in song as we begin. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter, I will not faint. He is my shepherd, I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy Welcome to our online Levy Church of Christ, but also to an in-person service. We haven't been able to say that for almost four months. So those of you that are watching online, you may notice today that we have invited a few more than the normally six to eight people that have been here required to carry on a worship service. Uh, but whether you are in this service or the online service at 10 o'clock, um, or in a service that follows that. We're doing those three services today. We want you to know that your presence as a worshiper of God is appreciated and all are welcome. Thank you for being here in whatever way that you are here. And we want to give one more special welcome of the day. May it be a blessed Father's Day to all of the fathers. And now let's continue as we worship our Father in heaven. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thy glory. Ooh. 
Bear with me so that uh, I don't have to attack the mic and make it too loud for all of us. Our reading this morning will be from Romans chapter 15, verses 4 through 8. We encourage you to go back and don't start at verse 4, but uh, well, read before and after. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant to you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Glorify... Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us, to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made to the fathers. Let's bow for a word of prayer as we continue our service this morning. Our Father, we realize that uh, you are the only true, the only living God. Be with us, Father, as we have seen things in, in our country and around the world who demonstrate the folly, the foolishness, and how, ba how bad it can be when people try to deny the existence of the true and living God. Help us, Father, to avoid putting ourselves first in so many ways that we can look to you. We pray, Father, that help us to be filled with knowledge of his, of your son's will and wisdom. Give us spiritual understanding so that we can walk worthy of the Lord, that we might please him and be fruitful in all good work. Help us, Father, to increase in knowledge of you. Be with us, strengthen us according to the power of the Lord. For we realize that all patience and long-suffering can be accomplished through joy. We realize, Father, that the hope of heaven is our motive for joy. Help us to grow in joy and especially in love. We give thanks to the Father who you have qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. For you delivered your Son, you have delivered us from the power of darkness through your Son. And help us, Father, as we fathom and understand more fully how that you have translated us into the kingdom of the, your Son. Be with us the short time that we're assembled here this morning, that we can worship and honor you in our worship to you. We pray in Christ's name, amen. You were despised, you were rejected, or those who passed by, be there. Yeah. 
Good morning. It's a privilege to be here this morning, uh, especially on this Father's Day. Dad's been gone for a few years now. But I was thinking about him and a conversation we had just a few years before his passing. Uh, in about this time in 1970, uh, I was leaving for Vietnam. And he told me three things. Be faithful to the Lord. Do your best. And when your time comes, come home. We never spoke of my service in Vietnam for over 40 years. And one day it was just he and I. And for some reason, it came up. And he told me that for that 13 months, he never had a full night's rest because he was concerned. What does that have to do with communion? Well, it has to do with another father, a father that sent his son into battle, a battle against Satan, a battle to save me. And I'm sure that the whole time that Jesus was here on earth. God knew the outcome, but God still had those feelings that his son needed to come home. We all know he died upon that cross. He rose on the third day, just like he had promised. And it's because of that and that blood that he shed and the body that he sacrificed that we commune today as we partake of this uh, bread, let's remember that body. Thank you so much, Father, for loving us beyond measure, for loving us so much that you sent Jesus to earth to die that I might be saved as well as all of those here on earth. Fathers, we partake of this bread, which represents his body that was broken upon the cross. Help us to do so in remembrance of that day, in remembrance of that love, in remembrance of the saving grace in Christ Jesus. Amen. Father, once again, we want to thank you for your love for us. We want to thank you for sending Jesus. Father, we want to thank you for the blood that was shed that cleanses us from all sin. Father, now as we partake of this emblem which represents that blood, help us to remember the saving grace that you have given us. In Christ's name, amen. Well, I hope you all have enjoyed Music in May, including Music in May, the June edition. 
because we didn't have enough time in May, so we just let it keep rolling. And of all the new music that we've introduced over the last uh, 24 months in particular, uh, this next song is probably one that has struck a chord with more people than, uh, than any other that we've introduced, uh, Living Home. <coughs> How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness your church. It is awesome to be here. Say amen to that. I'm used to being here with five or six folks, as Cecil said, and now I see this number, and I am excited about it. Of course, it's the first step 
as we move back to hopefully what will be normal again. Uh, and we appreciate you being out here on the very first Sunday that we're making that step. Of course, we'll have an 11 a.m. worship as well. And I get to preach twice. I think that's pretty awesome. You know, for a preacher, when you can say, hey, you get to do it two times on Sunday morning, that, that is amazing. Turn over to Romans 15. We're going to actually this morning finish our study in this book. We have been in this book since the beginning of the year. And I'm glad that I'm able to conclude it by preaching in person to a group as I started it instead of only live stream. And we're still live streaming, so I want to say hello to everyone out there. Thank you for joining us at 10 a.m. And we're going to be doing this for the foreseeable future. Romans 15 is the completion of the narrative, if you will, that Paul began in the first chapter. He's summing up everything that he has said and taught to this point with some very pointed, purposeful, encouraging, and needed teaching to wrap everything that he's been saying up to the point, giving it to the Romans so that they can start actually putting it all into practice. He starts by using Scripture. Of all the voices that they were hearing, now, I hope that you've stayed with me all year as we've studied this book and as we've tried to keep it rooted into context because it's, it's significantly important that we always keep Scripture in its context because if we don't, then we can take it out of context. It can become a proof text, and basically it can mean anything we want it to. And when we think about all of the voices that were being heard in the Roman churches, now the Roman churches, if you keep reading, and I hope you'll read chapter 16, Paul, Paul addresses all of the house churches in Rome. Don't think of the church in Rome like one big building and everybody came to it. Think of it kind of like we've been going through, where folks were meeting in their homes. Now, obviously they didn't have this technology, but they were meeting in homes scattered throughout Rome the city of Rome. And it could have been that they were, the home churches were Jews and Gentiles, or it could have been they were both Jews and Gentiles, or it could have been a mixture of all of that. But there are all these church, home churches that are in this city that are meeting. And consider all of the voices that were being heard. If you stayed with us during the study, then you know the tension between the Jew and Gentile and how they were passing judgment on one another, pointing fingers at one another over things they were guilty of themselves, how they were arguing disputable matters that we looked at in Romans 14 over food and over holy days. And all of these things were part of the conflict and the tension that existed in that church, the, the Jews wanting the Gentiles to become more Jewish in order to follow Jesus, the Gentiles resisting that. And so we have all of these circumstances and all of these voices that were being heard, sometimes maybe even pointedly, toward one another, at one another. And so Paul, in, as he concludes, as he brings it all together, he's going to bring in Scripture. Now for them, it was Old Testament Scripture, and he quotes some in uh, Romans 15. But he, he teaches them, he says, look, I want you to know all the things that are, have been said beforehand, all of that were written to teach us. Now, I don't know about you, but when I consider our current world with the tensions that exist, the judgmental attitudes that exist, the problems that we need to overcome, racism, injustice, all of those things that face us now, there are a lot of voices that are being spoken. There are a lot of words that are being said. Some are good words, some maybe aren't so good words, and that was the case in the church in Rome. There were good things being spoken, and there were things that weren't so encouraging being spoken. But in the midst of all of this, Paul said, turn to Scripture. And I think that can never do us wrong. In the midst of whatever challenges that we're facing with all of the different voices that exist and words that are being spoken, and there were an avalanche of words being spoken then, there are an avalanche of words being spoken now, let's turn to Scripture. Because it was written to teach us. And, and the words of God, the wonderful words of life are amazing and beautiful. 
They are challenging sometimes. But if we listen to them, we will follow the will of God in any circumstance. And that's exactly what Paul wanted the church in Rome to do. Follow the will of God in their context. Allow it to guide, to speak, and to lead them out of the tension and the problems that they felt in that church. And so he, he's, he's completing the narrative of the book. He started in chapter 1 in our theme verse, if you will, Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to save to the Jew first and then to the Greek. And he's completing that whole story here. He's turning their attention to the Word of God. He's, he's sharing with them what we know of as the Word of God. And so the encouragement is, as we learn to be unashamed in Christ Jesus, as we learn to be unashamed of the gospel story, as it, as it folds, unfolds in our life, let Scripture lead us. It is written to teach us what that means and what that is all about in our life. And Paul's purpose in writing this letter was to do exactly that, was to help the Jew and the Gentile both understand what it meant to be unashamed and how that played out in their church as they related to one another and were able to overcome the differences, the prejudices, the racism, the misunderstandings, the disputable matters, and everything that was in that hopper, listen to Scripture. Let it be primary over every other voice. Apply it to our lives in context. And, there, and then we will be able to truly be unashamed of the gospel of Christ. So he says, listen to that. Now, as we do, once we go through this chapter, these verses in this chapter, as we listen to what he's saying, which is Scripture, let's apply it first in its context, and then as we live in this world today, as things are happening all around us, uncertainties, let's allow Scripture to speak into that to see what it is teaching and what it is saying. And he, he teaches us in these verses some very amazing, wonderful, and powerful principles. First, he talks about hope. <clears throat> hope in this text. Bob read that to you. He starts really in this immediate context that we're focusing in on with hope, and he ends with it, as we'll see in verse 13. I don't know. If I was in the midst of the Roman circumstance with the arguing over disputable matters and being angry with other people because they didn't see things exactly like I did, maybe being disappointed with people because they didn't act like I wanted them to act or make choices like I wanted them to make choices or whatever the circumstance may be, if I had been in that context and maybe had sat down in a moment and started reflecting and thinking about that, I might lose hope. I might think, what's the point? You know, those guys over there are never going to think like I think. They're always going to be uh, in dispute with me on some matter. And so why do I need to even try? Does that sound familiar today? Again, we've got lots of voices that see things quite differently even in the church. And if we do allow that difference to overwhelm us, that we can sit down also and say, what's the point? Folks aren't going to see things like I see them. And so there's no hope. Paul speaking to counter that. There is hope. And the hope we find is in Christ Jesus, obviously. He's the great uniter. He is the great uh, reconciler if we focus in on Him, and we understand the promises that are found in Christ Jesus, then there is great hope, hope that we can overcome, hope that we can find common ground and lay aside differences, hope for the future in Him. The Roman church realized that hope, I believe. We don't know in terms of Scripture what happened after that, but we do know in terms of history, what happened to the church in the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century? They did amazing, wonderful things. It was a struggle. None of these things are going to happen overnight. Paul didn't expect them to. If you look in 
the entirety of Scripture, not much happened overnight. It even took Jesus three days to, to come out of the grave, if you will. It's a learning process. But Paul is saying that there's hope here. And he wants us to focus on that. We, if we look at headlines, for instance, again, we can think it's hopeless. But that's not our focus. It's written to teach us. It is written to teach us. That is our focus. And if we can, look past all of that and focus on what God is teaching and what He is saying on, on, on every matter, then certainly we will find hope. And that's what Paul was encouraging to do. Secondly, in this text, he encourages endurance. Endurance, wow, isn't that something that we need? Again, hope and endurance kind of go hand in hand. See, Paul is teaching here in this text the end game in, in one way as far as his narrative to the church in Rome is concerned. This is where he's coming to to bring it all into climax and in the end of his narrative and his story this is the end game of everything that he wanted to say to the Romans. But in the end game, we need to understand there's the long game, right? There's the long game. And that takes endurance to understand and to persevere in and to realize. And so Paul knew, again, nothing that, that, that little was likely to change overnight. That these folks in the Roman church came to their circumstances in Christ quite differently with different backgrounds and different social conditionings, with different attitudes and thoughts, and they brought all of that into the church. Again, seen and, and re-seen and illustrated in their differences and the disputable matters. And he knew that they, they needed time to be socially conditioned, if you will, in Christ Jesus, right? Right? And so he said, you need to have endurance. And all of these things that were written and everything that he was teaching was written and was taught so that that kind of endurance could develop within us. That we wouldn't throw our hands up and say, I give up. Again, there's no hope. But that we are able to endure through these kinds of challenges in our life. That was a message the church in Rome needed. That's a message that we need as well. We need to endure. We need to be in it for the long game. And how can we do that? These things were written to teach us how to do that. That's why Scripture, the Word of God, the voice of God, needs to be primary in what we are being conditioned by. Or the voice that we are hearing above everything else. All of the noise. These things were written to teach us so that we could have hope. And so that we could have endurance. And then the next thing he teaches is so that we could have encouragement. Again, this is something that they needed. Instead of saying it's hopeless and I'm going to give up and I'm so discouraged that I can't go on, find encouragement in Christ Jesus and even in one another as we go through this journey together. Even though our places on that journey are quite different. And this is something I think that needs to be mentioned in terms of the Roman context and our context as well, nobody is on the same place in their spiritual journey. There are different levels of maturity in Christ, in the church, in the Roman church, in the Levy church, and dare I say, in every church, people are, are on different places in the journey. And this is part of understanding each other and accepting each other as we're going to see in a moment. And all of that, you see, comes together to help us realize that. Hey, I'm looking at my brother and I'm looking at my sister over there and we're at a little different spot and maybe we don't see everything the same, but we're all on the journey, right? We're all marching, if you will, toward Christ. And so let's find some encouragement in that, that we're not marching away from Christ, that we're not... We haven't thrown our hands up and said, I quit. I just forget about it and turn back into the world. Let's find encouragement in this. This is Paul's message. As, as we understand what Scripture teaches and the Word of God is saying to us in our context, and we, we see that we have brothers and sisters, while not perfect and not having the same necessary understanding that we have on everything, we're still together. 
Let's find encouragement. I'm finding encouragement in the numbers this morning. I shout hallelujah, right? Let's find encouragement in what is taught and in one another. Let's be a conduit of encouragement as well. Be folks who, instead of walking around and repeating headlines and doom and gloom and it's going to COVID this and, and, and racism that, now I'm not making light of any of that. But what I am saying is, let's find a way to let the Word of God speak into that and to be encouraging in that to be part of God's solution instead of it's all terrible, awful, and it's never going to change. Does that make sense? Let's be people who will encourage the change that needs to be made, but also be people who encourage other people. A friend of mine said he was going to use this term this morning in a sermon Cecil, I think I'm going to beat him to it. Let's have a gospel pandemic. How about that? Let's have a gospel pandemic. Let's speak the Word of God. Let it teach us, and then let us speak it and be people of encouragement. And then next, he speaks of unity in this text. Unity. There was disunity in the Roman church, as we've seen in our study. But they were still holding it together. As far as I know, even though there was this disagreements and disputable matters and all of the things that were threatening to pull the church apart, they were still kind of hanging in there. And Paul was encouraging them to hang in there even more and find their common voice in Christ Jesus, to speak the same things. Now, that speak the same things and have that common voice did not mean they were in lockstep on everything. We know that from text. And we know from text that Paul said, that's okay. It's okay. What it meant was that they had the same heart for Christ and that they were committed to be his people through it all and in it all. There's nothing that will undermine these things that we have been taught, Scripture, Christ. Nothing that will undermine that more than disunity in the church. Paul knew that. That's why he was working so hard in this letter to help this church to heal. When churches divide and people get angry and split and call each other names and judge each other and point fingers and make assumptions and make accusations about one another, there's nothing Satan likes more because he wants to come and kill, steal, and destroy everything that God has given us. And so unity was important in the Roman text, to help them bridge the gaps that existed between them because of their backgrounds and be one in Christ Jesus, it still is. Paul told the Ephesian church to do everything that you can in Ephesians 4 to maintain the spirit, the bond of peace in the spirit of unity, to keep that together in Christ Jesus. And so we are equally challenged today to be unifiers, folks who are going to to preach and speak this word of God that is the gospel of, of reconciliation and bring everyone together in the common name of Jesus. And so this is the encouragement Paul gave the church in Rome, and it's also the encouragement today. And we can't go wrong by being unifiers, by being people who reach across the aisle and grab someone else's hand. Well, maybe we don't do that in COVID, do we? But you know what I mean, right? We reach out to be people who unify instead of people who polarize, that we do all that we can to be one and to witness in that unity to who Jesus is in our life. And then comes really what I see anyway in my study as the fulfillment, if you will, of Romans 1.16. And that is that we learn to accept one another just as Jesus accepted us. When he started the conversation and the entire narrative of the book of Romans in 116, it was about the gospel being the power to save to the Jew first and then to the Greek. He discusses that here in this text again. How, how Jesus, what, what he was able to accomplish through the Jews to the Gentiles, to the Greek, to bring them all together in as one, to be encouraged, to have endurance, and to have hope, 
And part of that, actually the essential part of that, was them learning to accept one another. Now, we think about that term, accept one another. And most of the time when we think about organizations or we think about clubs or we think about any kind of group of folks that get together that, that generally enjoy a fellowship of types that accept one another and, and greet one another, it's typically over some common, common interest or common uh, activity and most folks there are accepted because of their interest in that, right? And maybe even there's criteria to be met in some of that. Maybe we naturally kind of congregate to people who are like us, maybe that have the same skin color, or again, that have the common interests. We just sort of do those things, and Well, you see, here's something quite different that I want you to think about in the kingdom of God. When you have Jew and Gentile coming together, and we go back to Galatians 3, where Paul said, slave and master came together. Again, I don't think that we can truly appreciate exactly how wide that gap was. Even male and female, as Paul says in Galatians 3, 28, No male, no female, no Jew, nor Greek, no slave, nor free. And we might think, well, that probably wasn't a big deal with the gender gap. It really was in terms of of how and, and what the church brought to that discussion. And here, we're all coming together, all of these vast backgrounds coming together around the same table in Christ Jesus. How? Because we accept one another not based on any criteria that we develop, not because I like what you like or I look like you look or I went to the same school as you went or we're just naturally kind of buds or because I met some criteria that your organization or club decided was how you get in. You see, that's not it. And see, that's how we can accept one another here in Christ Jesus. That's how a slave and his owner, who in the Roman context would never, ever socialize. They were totally unequal. There was nowhere for them to meet anywhere like that in that culture except in Christ and in the church. There was no place in the Roman system for a woman to be valued equally as a man. It didn't happen. And certainly we already know from the study of the book of Romans the great divide that existed between Jew and non-Jew. Socially, uh, diet, practice, background, theology, everything. So all these diverse people are going to come together. How's that? They're going to accept one another as Christ accepted them. There's the criteria. Nothing else. It's not up to me to decide who's in and who's out. It's not up to me to throw up artificial barriers and say, you got to jump through all these hoops before you can. No, if Christ accepted them, if they came to faith in Jesus, right? If they came to faith in Christ Jesus and put him on in baptism and became a child of God, that's it. That's all. You see, Christ accepted their faith. Christ accepted them. So that's all I need. Oh, wait a minute. You've got to think like, you've got to look. Wait a minute. You've got to, you've got to practice this diet. No, you know, you don't. Wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, you know, you've got to circumcise your son. No, you don't. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Uh, I've got some holy days I want you to keep. No, no, that's not it. Wait a minute. You've got to Look like I do, worship like I do, think like I do on every little small thing. No, you don't. Because the the criteria is Christ has accepted you. And so I will. Amen? And that's how it was going to happen. And that completes that story and. The gospel, the power to save the Jew first and then to the Greek, the community that that produced is a community that accepted each other based on the criteria of the next point, Jesus Christ. Jesus. 
And that's how he ends. As he talks about Jesus becoming a servant, working through the Jewish people to become a blessing to the Gentiles. Again, this was all part of the will of God. This is all a part of the mission of Jesus. Everything that had been done from creation to here in Jesus had been done so they could form that community and be that people that could accept one another, that could be one in Christ Jesus, that could find encouragement and endurance and hope in Him. Jesus was the reason, the answer, the hope, the all in all, everything that brought it all together, or else it would not have been brought together. Paul talks about, not in this context, but in other texts throughout Scripture, of preaching the gospel of reconciliation, and really that's what he did. Jesus himself, as he died on the cross, Scripture tells us in Ephesians 2 that he made the two one, that the middle wall of, that divided the Jew and the Gentile was ripped asunder or torn down, and the hostility that existed between them in Christ Jesus had an avenue in which it would end. Same thing's true today. There's a lot of hostility. There's a lot of angry folks. There's a lot of injustice over which to be angry. Right? And there, as we sort all of this out, again, kind of going back to my first point, as we look at what Scripture teaches and points to, what it teaches and points to is Christ. And he's the reason why we have hope and we can overcome and why all of the tension that we exist can be overcome and why all of the differences can be bridged because of the work that he accomplished on the cross three days later as he arose from the grave. And there's the solution and there's the answer for the Roman context and whatever context we're in now. If we just look at what he did and what he taught. And Paul wanted to root and ground the Roman church, all of these Christians scattered all over the city in Christ, so that they could back off all of the anger they felt, all of the distrust they had, all of the uh, differences that they experienced, and start coming together as one. No other way could it be accomplished except in Jesus Christ. I can't think of another way, can you? I can't think of any legislation that's going to force anybody to do anything in terms of their hearts. Might change our actions, but in terms of our hearts, I can't think of any politician or any set of political doctrines that's going to do that. I can't think of anything. I can only think of Jesus who's going to have the power to change our hearts, and to bring us one in Him. And as he concludes, as we conclude Romans 15, I look at verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. As I mentioned earlier, he comes back to hope. Because we know, he knew, we knew, we know what hope means. And if we can have hope, and if we can look through even the darkest days and find a little glimmer of hope, it changes everything. I don't know if there's anything as devastating as being hopeless without any avenue through which to to see something better. And so he comes back to that. May the God of hope, the God of hope, That's who our God is. That's demonstrated in His Son, Jesus Christ. Fill you with all joy and peace. Amen. Don't we need joy and peace, church? Where we're going to find it in God, we're not going to find it on the news. (laughs) Right? We're going to find it in God. Joy and peace. The Roman church needed that. And it comes through trusting in Him. Sort of a same way of saying these things are written to teach us. Trust in God. Go with God. His words, allow His voices to be what you lean on and trust the most. And when that happens, you can overflow with hope. Let's be those folks who overflow with hope. I mean, it was really not much different in the Roman context. It was a brutal world. It was tough. It was hard. There were folks who were 
angry with each other, not just in the church, but in the culture at large. And so they needed hope in their world too. Our world needs hope. Who's going to deliver it? Those who overflow with it in Christ Jesus. Again, instead of, oh, it's terrible, it's horrible, it's doom and gloom. And let's be people who overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. He indwells us. So let Him loose in our life, in our world, in our family, and be these kinds of folks. This was the message the Roman church had to hear, needed to hear, and must heed for it to become the community of God that Paul so desired it to be. To be truly, 100%, altogether, un ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So the same, same thing is true for us today. Let's be unashamed. Thank you. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Traditionally, what we call family time, we don't have a lot of announcements today, but we do want to remind everyone, especially if you're participating in the online service, to still submit your prayer request, knowing that if you submit them online, they're, they're public, but we will pray for those, the shepherds will, during the week, and we'll make those available for others to pray for as well. Today, we do want to remember uh, missionaries in the field and the ones that we are particularly uh, bringing attention to this week uh, include Amy Tustin in Pennsylvania, Heath and Rebecca Amos in Rwanda, and Luke and Holly Brazel in Belgium, and also Igor and Natasha Igrev in Russia. So we want to remember them in our personal prayers and in our prayer today. <clears throat> Let us go to, to God in prayer at this time. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus, your son, and knowing that he is the reason that we are here. Father, we raise up to you uh, these workers in the field that we have mentioned, but also uh, for all your workers around the world who seek to follow you and who uh, seek to carry your gospel to others. Father, we pray that each one of us 
would have the spirit that would lead us to want to tell others about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is the good news of being part of his body. Father, I pray that as we go through this life, and especially in this time, that we look for ways uh, to be unified. Father, we know that as a church, we especially need to be unified as a body so that we can model for the world what it means to show love and what it means to have true unity. Father, I pray that, that we recall and seek to live the words that Paul told the Ephesian church when he said, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Father, help us to find the grace that you have given us. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.